Okay, Tom Davin, thank you for joining me. This is the inaugural Old Breed Companion Podcast for Free Range American. Maiden Voyage. Maiden Voyage. Send sail, you want a break from champagne bottles? Absolutely, we, we need to break them over somebody's head. <laughs> so if you guys don't know, Tom Davin has a resume longer than my, you know, and it is awesome that you're joining me for this. It's awesome that you are on the Black Rifle Coffee team coming in. And That's the most important thing. Yeah. Co-CEO. Right. Pretty cool title, pretty unique title. I'm the only co-CEO, there isn't another one. You're not one in a million. You're one in infinity, Tom. <laughs> it's it, one of one. Evan Hafer, CEO. I'm the co-CEO. Pilot, co-pilot. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm even, this Black Rifle machine's spinning so fast now. I'm, I'm mostly aware of everything that you've got going on, but what is like, you know, kind of your, your lighthouse for, for what you're doing here at Black Rifle now? So I like to say with Evan, Evan, you and Matt Best work on content, work on new products, work on all the media, leave all the things that you don't want to deal with to me and the operating side of the house. So oversimplification, but really running the kind of operating back end of the business. So we create all that demand with the great social media. I make sure we don't disappoint customers. We roast coffee, we bag it, we ship it out on time, we get Great T-shirts printed here with the team in Salt Lake City, and everything gets where it needs to get on time. Yeah, and something that uh, I, th I believe you said in your BRCC presents, and I've heard you say it yeah. a couple times, is allow people to do what they're uniquely good at. Amen. And, and I think that's so important, just outside of you know of a few select individuals, but when you know, regardless of what you're doing, like. You know, figure out what you're uniquely good at right. and figure out how to really focus on that and engage with that element of who you are. Yeah, it's really the notion of focus on your strengths. Don't try and address your weaknesses. And particularly in business, we all need to know what we're not particularly good at. Again, Evan Hafer could do everything. And in fact, he did everything at Black Rifle. But today as we've grown, he needs to focus on the things he does uniquely well with his gifts. Yeah. And so we first met, I think it was a couple of years now, um, when you originally came on the, I think it was the Blackhearted podcast. It was Blackhearted back in the day. Way a long time ago. And that's why you were the CEO for, for 511. Right. And, you know, I'm always interested to, to see your take on, on where we're staying because you are already at a very high level of business. And then, you know, we started having interactions and then you coming on board. Um you know, how do you kind of like feel about the whole BRCC sphere and, and where it's at today? Well, the great thing about Black Rifle is we started with a, a brand that's truly unique, has an authentic voice, has people who live the lifestyle from you to Matt, Evan, JT, a whole bunch of characters who are just living the brand. And that's what gets people excited about, hey, maybe I want to be part of that community. Maybe I want to try the product. And the coffee's fantastic. The gear is great. So it's an easy sell. Now we're just trying to get people into the tent, into the bigger community. And we're creating new lines of business. I call that vertical complexity. Horizontal complexity would be Panda, where you're stamping out more and more stores. Our vertical complexity really is all about how do we serve customers in new ways? How do we put product in Bass Pro Shop? How do we create a ready-to-drink product? Hey, wait, I've got one right here. Ooh. How do we create ready-to-drink coffee in a can, put that in 7-Elevens, Circle Ks, Speedways around the U.S.? How do we other things to let people enjoy the brand in new ways? Right. And the, the ready-to-drink stuff, that's something that you've pretty much been spearheading since we launched that earlier this year. Um, and we got some new flavors coming out pretty soon, or at least we're working towards right now. New flavors and more caffeine. Might even be... 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams. What Ooh. the heck? Because I just saw Monsters like coming out. That's their whole marketing campaign that they're working on right now. The Monster 300. Yeah. Yeah. Look out, Monster. We're coming. We're going to be knocking on your doors pretty soon here. Monster and Starbucks are hearing footsteps big yeah. time. Yeah. And it's been so interesting seeing how the coffee market has kind of played out throughout this 
quarantine corona time. Like I just saw Duncan just closed over 400, 400 retail yeah. stores and they don't know if they're going to reopen a lot of these. So having something like that come out because we right. were also in the huge period of expansion when it, when it yeah. comes to actual physical coffee shops too. Luckily, yeah, one is none and two is one. We, right. had, we have something else that we can push out here when the market's a little tricky. We'll get you around the clock. But the key is the morning day part is the most habitual part of anyone's day. You know, when I get up and most people, when they get up in the morning, they don't want to think. They just want to do what they did yesterday and get into their groove. A lot of those people had been going out to a coffee shop, but now for a lot less money, you can get the best coffee around when you have black ruffle coffee shipped to your house. Now you may have to grind the beans, you may have to pour water in the coffee pot, so it might be a little more work. People are finding that's easier than going out to a coffee shop. Yeah, it is. And they've created new habits. You know, 21 days to create a new habit. We're what, 121 days into this whole lockdown pandemic. God, has it been that long already? Depends on when you start. Yeah. Yeah, if you start, say, beginning of March, what's that? March, April, May, June, coming up on 100 days yeah. for sure, maybe 120. Have you had to make any real big lifestyle changes throughout this whole thing? I just miss seeing people at the office. Yeah. I'm a raging extrovert. I love walking the halls, high-fiving, fist-bumping, just catching up with everybody. You can't do that on Zoom. Yeah. It's so it's so disappointing, too. It's like yeah. n- people don't know how to greet each other anymore. You know, there's like, oh, do we tap elbows? Right. Like, can we fist bump? Is that okay? Or do we just, like, keep our six feet apart? Sure. You know? It's creating these really weird social, awkward engagements. Particularly with people you don't really know. I had my first business lunch with some insurance people here in Salt Lake City. Two days ago, when we walked into their office, they were on the other side of a big conference table. And I went, hey, and they just went, hi, lunch is coming in five. Like, okay then, and sat down. It was just really awkward. Yeah, yeah, I had another one like that. At, uh, I got to-go food from a restaurant in here in Salt Lake not too long ago, and, and I walk up to the, you know, the hostess stand right. that's inside the restaurant. And as I'm walking up, like, I, I see the... The lady gave me like this weird kind of cockeyed look and I'm like, oh, hey, I put a order in for takeout. She's like, um, please go stand out on the grass outside of the restaurant. We'll bring your food out to you. And I was like, <laughs> I was like okay, but like you don't have any signage up right. anywhere. Like I'm not You're supposed to know supposed it's to curbside, yeah. grass side pickup. So, you know, like a lot of the country, I'm sure, you know, mm. this stuff can go away sooner rather than later. We'll all be happy when that happens. In the meantime, we're selling coffee. Slinging yeah. beans, as I like to say. Slinging beans. Sling them. Slinging beans, I like that. Well, Tom, you were um, really one of the first people that I ran this whole old breed concept by. And, um, you know, I was, I was pretty ecstatic that that you were enthusiastic about the whole concept in general. And and I hope, uh, you know, after this one, we get into your background, you right. know, we can kind of Double team some other devils and absolutely and pull out pull out some knowledge and some experience and tell some stories in this and basically you know but old breed in a nutshell is um, former Marines talking about you know the the ways of the military and right. and paying an homage to those guys that came before us in a way indeed and what do you think of with the term the old breed what does that mean to you. Yeah, I I kind of right now, you know, I really envision like those guys from the greatest generation, mm-hmm. the guys wearing those frog skin camo that yeah. that <clears throat> island hopping campaign after island hopping campaign that you know you go back and you read those stories and you know there, there's a a decent amount of other media right. and, and film about it at this point, but. Man, they, those guys did not have it easy. And, no. And you think about... You didn't of, rotate out unless you got shot. Some of the the most austere conditions that you could have imagined, you know, right. and, and it's so much different than the European campaign um, with having to go through those horrid winters in, in Bastogne and stuff mm-hmm. like that. They didn't have to do that, but they had to deal with, um, you know, just having to fight in a jungle on right. coral against the kamikaze enemy... Right. And you haven't had a drop of water in 24 hours. Like the the amount you have to be 
the fortitude you have to have to to go through something like that. Right. When, you know, a lot of these companies lost half of their guys right out of the gate. Oh, yeah. In the, in the, in the beach. The beach. Yeah. And then, you know, that's just getting going. Right. Just getting to work. And <clears throat> so I wanted to to dig into to your Marine Corps career a little bit. And, Absolutely. And you joined in, in 1979? 1979, right? graduated from Duke University, got my commission in early May, and off I went to Quantico, the best name of any school of higher education in the military, the basic school, TBS, which can be modified to mean a whole lot of things. <laughs> yeah. And what was it always a, a no-brainer for you that, that you were going to join the Marine Corps? It became a no-brainer when I got to college. So yeah. uh, when I was in high school, I decided to join the military. Ended up getting a Naval ROTC scholarship to Duke. Uh, this is post-Vietnam, 1975, uh, fall of 75 when I went to school. Saigon had fallen that prior spring of 75. Being in the military was not cool. So when I got to Duke and started wearing my Navy whites around campus, I was in the decidedly uncool camp. Yeah. And I looked at the esprit that I saw in the Marine Corps and ultimately said, I want to be with those people because no matter what happens, I'll be in shape. I'm going to be with people who are fired up and really care. Right, right. And so Jordan 79, TBS. Right. And then... Did you have yeah, so a the, pre-selected? Yeah, the funny story was I had an air contract. So vis-a-vis -vis Naval ROTC, they guaranteed I could go to flight school. So when I was about to graduate from the basic school, which runs about six months in Quantico, they said, great news, you've got your air contract. You report to Pensacola, Florida for flight, flight training in 18 to 24 months. Not weeks, year and a half to two years wait. I said, okay. Then I'm going to have a commitment on the backside of flight school of another five to six years. How about infantry? How about 0302? So rather than go to flight school, I went to infantry officer's course, got shot out of that cannon to 1st Marine Division. The old breed. The old breed. That's it. And uh, did you get stuck with a specific unit? How did that whole career path go from after getting through TBS? Yeah, so TBS, IOC, had my choice of Hawaii or California. I'd really never left the East Coast. So I said, how about California? I showed up with another second lieutenant at Regimental HQ, 1st Regiment, 1st Marine Division. I was with a gentleman named Bill Parsons from my TBS and IOC class. We walk in, the S1, the adjutant, looked at us said, are you dirt balls? Davin, you're going to 3rd Marines, or 3rd Battalion, rather. Parsons, you're going to 1st. 1st is moving out on deployment. Uh, Westpac cruise in two months. Aye, aye, sir, we spin on our heels, walk outside. Parsons says, well, geez, you know, I just got married. I can't go on deployment in two months. And I said, let's go, we're going back in there. Sir, the lieutenants would like to request we trade battalions. What, what are you doing here? Sir, I'd like to go to 1st first, first Battalion, 1st first Marine Regiment. <laughs> Parsons was like, yes, sir, I'd like to go to 3rd and not leave for another year and two months rather than leaving in two months for a six-month deployment. And the Regimental S1 said, great, get the hell out of here. So I got to Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Regiment. So if I can imagine looking back on that when he said that to you you were probably like, you were just probably chomping at the bit like oh totally. yeah of course I want to deploy before rather than waiting so you know that was probably like oh yeah let's just switch this out in there absolutely and then my company commander was a guy named Bob Blose who probably was 32 33 as a marine captain at the time absolutely chiseled complete badass he was what I would consider at that point old breed, intimidating as hell, but he turned out to be one heck of a leader. Yeah, because I have to imagine it, fairly similar experiences between you and I in the sense of you probably showed up and uh, had interactions with a lot of guys who had fought in Vietnam and were still in, and, and I came in as Iraq right. was going on. So yep. a lot of my seniors had all done Iraq deployments at that. And it's a lot different showing up to the fleet with these guys who have already 
gone through the trials of combat right. as opposed to a peacetime thing. I think um, you generally have a overall more respect, like out of the right. gate, just because of what you know you, you understand these guys have gone through. Like they've done the task that, right. that the infantry is set to do. They had that quiet swagger. They knew what they knew. Yeah. And <clears throat> what was that like for you uh, looking back to like get your first platoon? I would say it was pretty damn intimidating because I went to a big public high school. I never really had any speaking classes in high school or college. Played sports and was captain of a couple of teams. So I was used to getting in front of a group of lacrosse players or football players. Okay, men, we're going to win the game. But it's a little different when all of a sudden, here you are, new boot second lieutenant. You've got 40-some-odd Marines. You've got to stand in front of them every morning and multiple times throughout the day and get them to follow your lead, particularly when you're the new guy. That was really intimidating. So I don't know if they all knew I was nervous, but I was nervous as hell. Yeah, and with a group of guys like that, you know, first impressions mean everything. They're going to yeah. they're gonna remember that. They smell and, it out. Yep, yep. Especially if a whole bunch of those guys who been fighting previously or, you know, your squad leaders had right. been, been doing hard work for a long time. I like to say the thing I learned with that first platoon command was I learned to listen to my NCOs. So a lot of people have the misconception, particularly in the Marine Corps, you just give orders, whether you're an NCO or an officer. That might work. You're going to start getting left-handed salutes and other things like that. So what I learned to do was talk to Staff Sergeant Molina, my platoon sergeant, talk to the squad leaders. All right, gentlemen, here's what we've been asked to do. We have to clean the head today, or we're going to do a maneuver, or we're going on a deployment. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. What do you think? You get their input, then you write your five-paragraph op order. Then when you give it, they're like, roger that, sir. Yeah. The worst thing you can do is just say, we're going this way. Yeah. And they have no clue why. Well, that way they're they're a part of the whole process. You know, right. They're... they're it's not just orders coming down from higher, you know, it's, it's, you know, they help the process to get to where they're going. Big and, time. and that was always, you know, from the enlisted side of things, the, what you re- respected the most about officers when, when they didn't feel like, when you didn't feel like it was just always an iron fist coming right. down or you, you do it, you always, a lot of times you would feel one or two steps removed from, mm-hmm. from the officers. And it was always those officers that kind of acted like enlisted guys that, that you really like felt like you could work with and, and were a little bit more comfortable around and, and wanted right. to, to work a little bit hard for the, uh, the first platoon commander I had was a former enlisted guy. Mm. And he just, you were had, lucky. Yeah, I, I really was. And the second lieutenants are dangerous. Yeah. 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 And you know, uh, having someone, and I didn't know this, but I guess the Marine Corps is the only one that had the term Mustang. Mm. I, don't, I, I never don't think, knew that either. Yeah, I don't think that got over to the military or uh, the, the army because I, I brought that term up. Like, what are you talking about? What's right, that? prior enlisted. Yeah, yeah. And, and I will say um, that <clears throat> his name was Lieutenant Cassidy at the time. I, he had a larger impact on, mm. on my growth and, and my path in the Marine Corps than any other Marine that I ever came right. in contact with. He. Um, he really took me under his wing on, on my first deployment and really kind of set the stage and, and helped me align what I wanted to do with what he knew about the Marine right. Corps. Stellar guy, Silver Star in, in Fallujah. And, Damn, and then, he's a guy you want to listen to and yeah. follow. Yeah, exactly. So he was old breed in that era. He was. He probably wouldn't consider himself mm. that way at the time, but, you know, I I for sure looked at right. him. You know, when, when, you're, a, when you're a young Lance Corporal, and and you're looking up a Silver Star citation mm-hmm. for the guy that's leading you, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, holy, like right. he took shrapnel in his liver, pulled a guy out of the street, mm-hmm. coordinated air support, saved this guy, and then was like bleeding out right. and just happened to get found before Damn. you know his heart right. stopped beating. Sure. Like, yeah, I think I'll listen to this guy. And like mm-hmm. he, he already has my respect regardless of of what I've known about it, interactions. Yeah. You know, just coming into the fleet. So that that was a huge, huge effect for me yeah. on, on the beginning of my Marine Corps career. Yeah. I was reflecting on what it means to be part of the old breed last night. And that was one of the criteria I came up with tough, physically and mentally tough, 
at the same time humble. So I'm guessing he rarely ever talked about that. You had to drag it out of him. I did. I did. And, you know, a lot of the, the those guys you would consider old breed, you know, they don't they don't really want to talk about things. And they're even kind of are hard to accept that they, they've, they've gotten something for their mm-hmm. valor. You know, they, they, right. want, they want their current and present actions to be the thing that you're going off of, you know. And I think that's just— Big time. That, that's an attribute of, yeah. of a good leader. Right. They're in the present moment. They're mission-driven, focused on the task at hand and their people. Yeah. There's this saying that um, I, I've heard it for a while now, but it, but it keeps coming back up. It keeps coming back up. And it's uh, the way that you do anything is the way that you do everything. Wait, and that's my quote. Is it? No, it's not. I've never heard it. I got it that. from Andrew Churn. Oh, really? I'm quoted on the internet as using that because I said that all the time (laughs) at Panda. But I think it's so true. It means you can't be super organized in one part of your life and totally disorganized in the other. It carries through. The way you do the little things is the way you would do everything. Yeah. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Yep. And that that works back to, um, you know, one of, uh, I think, the most important things that you can have as a, as a young Marine is, is just be detail oriented. Yeah. Pay attention to everything, pay attention to the little right. things. Cause if you do that, then sure. all that stuff is going to add up and you're going to be successful with, with the big things down the line. And right. that's, that's exactly the way the, uh, that Lieutenant Kennedy or uh, Cassidy was with us is like, I remember being in Jordan and, mm-hmm. and we were there for a short stint doing a, doing a few week training op. Right. And, uh, someone let, we, we had like those little Gatorade pouches in our MREs at the time. Yeah. And then they would have like a big box of just the like Gatorade sure. pouches. Yeah. And somehow, some way, a box of those got over the berm <laughs> and scattered everywhere, like right what in front, the? like the, as you're driving right. in. And it turns out it was from somebody in our platoon and he just wrecked all of us. Like, <laughs> he didn't think it was funny. No, no, no not no at all. No sense of humor in that. No, I was like, I remember seeing like he had all of our NCOs on like mm. this two hour death run and he's just running all of our NCOs around us yelling at us. And I'm like, you know, we're all just right. sitting there like, oh, something really, really bad is coming, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, but he knew how to get everyone from the the senior NCOs down to us, like motivated to yeah. not fuck up again. Nice. You know what I mean, like yeah. after he you slid- You never the, forget that one. No, no. Cause you know, we're in Jordan and the, the area we were in the soil was like just hard rock. Mm-hmm. And all the NCOs were like, you're going to dig fighting positions five feet deep un, until it's done. And right. so the rest of the night, our whole platoon- was just digging into rock until what kind of tools did you have just an (laughs) e-tool that's all you need that's it that was it yeah Um, but i would say that attention to detail and the way you do anything is the way you do everything really is an unstated but foundational principle of the marine corps and that applies throughout life if you can hang with that it does because those those things that you don't pay attention Mm. to uh, even if you're doing a whole bunch of stuff really well they will come back, they'll bite you in your ass, and then they'll slow down this thing that, that you right. feel like you're really doing well and yeah. you're paying attention to. How many times did we hear, never assume? It breaks down into, it makes an ass out of you and me. Yeah. So true in business, so true in life. Yeah. And, you know, leave it to the Marine Corps to come up with phenomenal acronyms to, to keep everything super simple. Right. Yes. <laughs> Keep yeah. it simple, stupid. <laughs> or sir, as the case may be. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> anything really stick out to you in that? Uh, getting your first platoon and going through that? Yeah, muscle? overcoming anxiety and then uh, funny small world story. We deployed about a month after I got that platoon. Oh, wow. So that is but, not a lot of time to... No, but we deployed to San Antonio, Texas to Camp Bullis to be aggressors for an army unit. <laughs> we were there about two weeks, and we came back and flew over to Okinawa, Japan on a Westpac rotation. Okay. That was great, because the last thing I wanted to do was stick around in garrison for a year, year plus, waiting to go overseas. Yeah. And, and then, so, 
<clears throat> what was that process like um, going through growing through your head and, and, and working through the Marine Corps at that time? Because um, Beirut happened shortly after you. Yeah, so Operation right? Eagle Claw happened in 1980 when I was over in Okinawa. And then I think Beirut and Grenada were 83, if I'm correct. And by then I had come back and joined 1st Recon Battalion. But certainly when we're all in Okinawa, Japan on kind of a ready status, we heard about Eagle Claw and Desert One. We're like, send us, let's yeah. go. Give yeah. us a piece of the action. Yeah. We didn't get that call. And uh, <clears throat> you decided to go recon. Yeah, sure. so came back and if I were to stay with the battalion, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, it was going to be another 18 months till I had another rotation. I probably could have had weapons platoon. So I applied to go to 1st Recon Battalion, had to do a screening, a whole bunch of interviews, and I got picked up. My first job was the assistant OPSO, S3 Alpha, as you probably know the buzzword. Which would be... Um... So I basically ran training for a guy who was Major Tom Guinea, who was definitely old breed. So Tom Guinea was probably at the time six foot six, just a beast of a guy. He could do anything that anybody in recon could do, but better. So he would often lead recon battalion PT. He would typically rig helicopters for spy, repel, or parachute operations. If it was a small boat operation or a dive bomb, Major Guinea was out there. Yeah. And those, those leaders that are always in the trenches with you, like, just has such a big effect on on the morale of, right. of everybody under him when you're like, oh, yeah. he's right next to me. Right. It, it really changes the overall attitude and confidence of, of unit cohesion. Absolutely. But he screwed me right away because I was his assistant ops, so basically training officer for the battalion. He's like, Davin, you need to go to some schools. You've been to Airborne. So I took my dive physical to go to scuba school. At that point, it's probably going to be with the Navy. And uh, lo and behold, about two weeks later, I'd gotten the results back, cleared, ready to go. A good buddy of mine named Bob Corscatton had a slot to Ranger School. He got NPQ'd because of his physical like a week before shipping out. And Guinea said, hey, you're going to Ranger School next week. I was like, sir, I think I need a little prep time. I don't even have jungle boots. <laughs> Not been through the Ranger and Doc, none of that. He goes, yeah, figure it out, go. Yeah. So that was March of 1981, class 781. I rolled down to Ranger School. Just thrown in the fire. Exactly. That's when you learn the best, though, when you're, when you're just. And you have it no time to spot. worry about it. Anticipation yeah. could be the worst. Yeah. And I, I think you're the only Marine I know that has ever gone to Ranger School. It turns out a guy who became my best buddy named Mark Houck was another recon Marine lieutenant. And oddly enough, with more than 100 students in Class 781 at Ranger School checking in Fort Benning, they put us in the same squad. Oh, really? I was like, what were they thinking? Are they hoping we get mad at each other? So we were not Ranger buddies. We ended up being Ranger buddies in the third phase down the swamp for a yeah. little bit. But... Of course, two of us looked at each other and said, we're not quitting and we're going to bring everybody in this squad with us. Yeah. So I'm curious, how, how did uh, the rest of the Army Cats like take you devils being in there? I think the other students were fine, kind of mildly amused. The instructors, the Ranger instructors or our eyes loved to abuse us. Yeah. They were full of what I hadn't appreciated was chesty puller history. <laughs> How did Chesty Puller earn his third silver star or Navy Cross? I'm like, I, I, I don't know, Ranger. How can you, are a Marine, how do you not know that? You don't know your history around Chesty Puller. So after that, that became part of our Ranger School in doc prep. Like, yeah. you have to know this yeah. stuff, guys. Yeah. So on top of getting less than a week time of prep to go right. down there, you immediately show up and you got a target on your back. We're going totally. that whole thing. Which we like as Marines. Yeah. Yeah, and then you you ended up through, and you were you were the honor grad of that class. Right? I managed to luck out and get the Merrill's Marauders Award and the honor grad award. Yeah. Luck out, little, yeah, little, little humble pie there, but yeah, but you know, if you're leading a patrol and you screw it up, a lot of that might be bad luck. You're done. Yeah, yeah. So 
<clears throat> after after you get through that, um, what what was kind of the rest of your your time in the core like? So basically, I was able to spend a couple of years at First Recon Battalion, end up going to special special forces combat diver school, combat diver soup school. Spent the better part of the winter down in Key West. Love that. Never wore imagine. the green hat, but wore the Marine Corps cover, of course. And after a couple of years there, I got chopped over to Okinawa. I was supposed to go to Landing Support Battalion. I was supposed to get that little red target on my hat. Is okay, you've got too much time in infantry and recon, you're going to the support role. Just so happens as I showed up in Okinawa, this is 1983. They had just had a terrible training accident at the Northern Training Area Reservoir, NTA it was called at the time. They put four Marines in the water and three drowned in a parachute accident. Didn't have the safety boat, didn't have the water wings on the guys, didn't have any of that. And it turns out when I was at First recon, having been the training officer, I tried to get everything out of Tom Guinea's head. So I sat down and along with my gunny, wrote the air operations manual, spy manual, small boat manual, scuba ops manual, wrote all those SOPs, documented that again, probably pretty basic stuff, but it literally was only tribal knowledge when I got there. So we had all that written out in manuals. So when I showed up at Camp Hansen, over in Okinawa to check into LSB, some colonel comes over to me and looks at me, snarls, are you Davin? Yes, sir. Are you the guy who did all the manuals at first recon? Yes, sir. Go to third recon, you're the new op, so get them unfucked <laughs> and bring over anybody you need to help you out. Yeah. Okay, aye, aye, sir. So spun on my heels, went up to Camp Schwab, called Mark Houck and Bob Corsken, a number of my officers and NCOs from back at First Recon, we got that place squared away. The reward for doing a good job is more of the same. More work, yeah. yeah. That's a that's a pretty heavy task to to have to jump into right after a, a training accident like that. And I think people want to like assume that the military just has all their shit figured out and ducks in a row. And, yeah, you know. A, Things evolve so fast <clears throat> in the world and in the military. Yeah. That a lot of times, uh, you have to go through this constant revision of things, and you know that's that has such a profound effect for right. schools, for mm -hmm. for tactics moving forward throughout history. That, it's a pretty tall task, Tom. Huh? At the time, the Marine Corps was not well funded. It was post Carter. Wait, is it funded good now? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit, slightly better. At least get a few new camouflage utilities every <laughs> once in a while. But we were broke at the time. So guys were doing operations they probably had no business doing. They just weren't trained, didn't yeah. have the right equipment, probably didn't have the water wings to put on the parachutists at the time. So that was a tough one. So we just rebuilt it from scratch. Had a colonel named Lieutenant Colonel Wild Bill Tehan. Old breed man, two tours in Vietnam, had fought in Laos, had been in North Vietnam for a prisoner exchange. He became our CO, one heck of a leader. I then worked for a guy named uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Admire, became a general. So they were tremendous people. And the commanding general, what was called the MAF at the time, Marine Amphibious Force, was Robert E. Habel. And Robert E. Habel had enlisted in the Marine Corps at the end of World War II fought in World War II, fought in Korea, multiple tours in Vietnam. He was probably 55 when I met him. Just hard as nails, could outrun most anybody on the base. And I would go down and request money from him. Wow. And it was great. So you know, we wanted free fall equipment. We needed LAR-5 rebreathers and things like that. So I'd make the trek down with one of my commanding officers and make the pitch and he'd say, oh my God. Do we really need to spend $100,000 on free fall equipment? Yes, General. Well, why? Sir, if you don't have that capability in the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, you know who's going to take it? Either the Navy SEALs or the Army Green Beret. Okay. We'll take it. <laughs> Funded. Get out of here now. Yeah. Then six months into my one-year tour over there, I got a call from the General's office. Hey, this is the General's current aide. The General wants you to consider being his aide. And uh, I got myself out of that one because I had one of the best jobs in the Marine Corps. I ended up taking over command of Bravo Company, 3rd Recon. 
but I dodged the bullet with the general. But he and I became great friends and stayed in touch until he passed a couple of years ago. And uh, he was definitely part of the old breed. Today, I have his Corvette. Oh, yeah. So, because I got to know him and we were both Pennsylvania Marines and we loved cars. We would talk cars all the time. And when he passed away, his wife, Barbara, and their two daughters wanted me to buy the car from the family estate. So I did. So I've got General Robert E. Hable's 1967 Sky Blue Corvette convertible with two general stars on the front left windshield. <laughs> and some of my old friends are like, you're impersonating a general. It's like, I don't even do that anymore. <laughs> you don't see general stars on cars going into bases now. I bet uh, I bet that's pretty easy for you to get on a base with that thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Few of the rookies just salute, let me pass. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. You ever pull any old stories out of those guys when you go and talk to them? Mostly Vietnam stories, yeah. you know. They typically didn't want to talk about Korea or even World War II in the case of General Hable. But General Hable uh, just loved to sit around, have beers, and tell stories. Yeah, and, you know, it's, <clears throat> it is awesome to see it. Um, I think we were talking about this the other day, as for, or maybe it was a collective you, me, and Evan conversation. But um, the, the brotherhood that exists you know, I, at one point, I think it's it was termed, like, you know, the, the tightest fraternity in the United States right. or, or something along those lines. It and, might be sexist now, we have to say <laughs> communal organization or something. The tightest communal organization in the country. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's been really cool to see it after, yeah. after getting out how how tight that, that brotherhood still is with, within guys who are in the Marine Corps. Right. Um, it's a really good thing to have in your back pocket moving For forward sure. in life. Well, what I like is, unlike I may find with some of my friends, who say, hey, stranger, you haven't called me in a while. It's like, dude, are you kidding me? All my Marine friends are like, hey, man, how are you? What's new? Yeah. How's the wife? How are the daughters? What's going on? What can I do for you? You just snap right back into where you left it. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that 100%. Yeah. You just... You don't feel like you skip a beat. You don't. Right. You don't guilt the other person into feeling bad because sure. you haven't talked in forever. Because right. there, you get out and there's just no way you yeah. can you can keep up with all the boys. It's so difficult. And and what I love is like <clears throat> a lot of the guys I was in with are like still doing incredible things mm -hmm. today. You know, like when I catch up with this, my buddy Nick who was a machine gunner and, and did a Mars Afghanistan push uh, in 2010. I call him up and, and, you know, he's like, oh, I finally got back into the reserves because he was trying to get back into <laughs> the reserves. Good they wouldn't him. let him in yeah. because he got a full sleeve tattoo and they made right. that a thing to where yeah. he couldn't get in there. So he was, he's a, he's a teacher. Right. Back in the reserves. He's like, yeah, man, I'm, pretty close to, right. to getting into the, the FBI. And I'm like, see, uh, that, that, right on. Yeah. yeah. You know, to where it's like, oh, these guys that, you know, you connect with when you're 18, yeah. 19 years old, uh, and then you get a bit later in life to to see like that American pride come through and that, that ability for guys not to yeah. like get stagnant and, and, you know, kind of comfortable in their life. Right. Like that personality type that really develops and gets molded in the Marine Corps, like it doesn't go away. No. People keep climbing the ladder afterward. Indeed. They do great things, big and small. Yeah. I called my buddy Mark Hack yesterday, and we were just talking about, like, who was the most old breed Marine we served with? We landed on it was either General Robert Habel or later General Hank Stackpole, but he was a colonel with 7th Marines when we served with him, and he had taken, like, a 50-cal round in Vietnam. Unbelievable. But he was one of these people who not only was mission-focused all the time, not only was hard as woodpecker lips, but just truly loved his Marines. We served with him for probably three months on deployment up to the Aleutian Islands. No. 
And I ran into him like 20 years later. It's like, Davin, you snake eater. And he goes into a story about exercise, Colonel Potlatch in the Aleutian Islands, heavy seas, small boat landings and all that. It's like, you wonder how can a man like that remember? Yeah. Well, because he cared that much about his people. And that was um, another thing when you're like thinking about what constitutes a good leader. Right. Right. It was always um, <clears throat> the guys that led by example, you know, to where you feel like they're in the trenches as you. Absolutely. And, and you're not, you're not one step removed from them. Right. And I remember, I don't know why this sticks out to me so much, but um, my buddy uh, Sibley, Corporal Sibley, uh, you know, it was one of those like, because you get to that point in the enlisted ranks where, you know, you're you're still a, a lowly E3, you're a yeah. senior lance corporal, and you're waiting to pick up NCO. Right. And, but you have a good relationship with your NCOs because they they take responsibility for you and, and they really want to see you grow. And, yeah. And he was telling me about how he had this troublesome Marine who, who he couldn't get to, you know, follow orders and, and get with get on the team and he's like it's like stark what do you do when you have someone who won't listen to orders mm. and can't do anything and, and, and you can't beat him can't at least beat not him. as your first move yeah you know hazing only goes so far <laughs> <laughs> uh it, and i was like yeah you know i wasn't quite sure what answer he wanted he's like mm -hmm. lead by example mm -hmm. they people like that you know even Sometimes it, they don't need a vocal instruction; right. they need sure. a physical one. You know, and, and that's show me, what, don't tell me. Yep, exactly. You know, doing is greater than talking. Right. And that's something that's stayed with me throughout my entire life, and and something that I still try to do. Uh, really, my primary leadership mm -hmm. technique here at Black Rifle is like, you know, lead by example. Right. Like, like show everybody that that you're not just you know trying to play master of puppets and, and pull right. strings and be like, go out there and do that. And and people will aspire to to do sure. those types of things, you know. And there's a great responsibility within yeah. that with where like, you know, when you're thinking about how to act and what to do is like, I, I, you've got to be thinking big picture and thinking about the, what's going to be the most value mm -hmm. and, and the best decision in the, in the shortest amount of time. Yeah. And there is an element of theater, you know, having people see you lead by example. And I would say being tough is not just being individually tough, but sharing hardships with your troops or your Marines in the military or sharing hardships in business. Mm -hmm. No one wants to work for a boss who, yeah, they might be tough individually, but they're not willing to go the extra mile for the team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How often do we see that? It's like, I'm now the senior leader Got my reserve parking spot. I'm going to eat first. I'm going to take care of myself. Good luck, guys. Yeah, time Hopefully to just sit back and chill. I've made yeah. it, you know. Yeah. And a, a good example of someone who didn't do that was, um, <clears throat> you know, Brian Shantosh. I do, yeah. Uh, Tosh. Yeah, he, he's yeah. he's one of those guys I would, I would definitely consider old breed, and um, he's on the short list to, to do a podcast oh, yeah. with. And he was, uh, he was a, company CEO uh, during my first deployment when, you know, I was a lowly PFC nice. on our first, on our first pump. And he, he got, we were in, I think we were in Kuwait and um, he was religious about training, mm. like to the point where I was like, yeah. I, I wished I was in his company because mm. they were always pushing themselves so really? far. They were always doing the hardest thing. He's a beast. He is. Yeah. Do you know, he has a tattoo on his back that says weak people suck. <laughs> I know he's not a weak person, that's for sure. He, he Dude not. can run 24 hours at a time in a deprivation chamber. It's like, that's just not right. Yeah. No, he's I, a freakazoid. He is. We, we would have these, like, you know, the the showers and bathrooms that we would yeah. have are, are all just open and, and right. group stuff. And, and I remember um, w walking past him and I was... <clears throat> we were, what he was, was naked? Well, he was wearing he was wearing pants. <laughs> yeah. His shirt was off, but right. he, he refused to do a couple things that mm. were Marine Corps standard. You know, right. like everybody had to wear a web belt, but uh. he, he wore a leather belt. Okay, so he's nice. sitting there brushing his teeth, and I'm just I'm just walking down the line, and I, I see this big wide back, and I look, and I'm like, 
weak people suck at the top of his oh back. Oh my God, like, isn't that great? Is this guy. <laughs> right. And I look over, I was like, oh, it's Captain Shantai. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's not showering with the officers. Like he's right. in the trenches yeah. with this guy. And, and, you know, that has such a huge impact. And then uh, he did this training evolution where he boxed every single person in his company for 60 seconds. <laughs> That's great. And How I, much time in between rounds? Like a minute. 30 seconds, okay. Yeah, it was like minute a minute on, minute, on, minute, minute off. off yeah. With like 250 guys. Damn. Yeah. Guys wanted to be later in the lineup, see if they could land a good one. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, he was like, he, he was that guy. Uh, he, at that point, he, yeah. he he was a Navy Cross recipient for, for his actions in Iraq. and you know, He was it, not resting on his laurels. No, he was not. Yeah. Not even close. Yeah. You know, and another one of those ones where, like, you look back and a couple of these guys have such profound effects on you. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, yeah, they're always kind of in the back of your head to where it's like, well, when you're thinking about your actions, like, ah. How do I live up to that standard? Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Which is really, yeah. you know, what, you know, kind of this concept of mm. old breed is, is really just right. like, how do I live up to that standard mm -hmm. while you're in and, and afterward? Keep trying to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. So you had a, you got out eventually. Yeah. And <clears throat> what was that decision like for you to, to part ways with the Marine Corps? I loved being a Marine. I loved being in a command out in the field. Really didn't want to ever work in an office in the military. So when I was at Third Recon, I got orders to go to recruiting duty in your home state, not your hometown, but Lansing, Michigan. So I was bobbing and weaving, trying to figure out my way. Old Spartan territory. Trying to avoid that one. I ended up uh, getting orders to flight school, but I got NPQ'd. They said my right eye was not 2020. I think a Navy doctor didn't like me. I'm still 2020 today, so go figure. So I requested MAST with the Commandant of the Marine Corps. I want to request MAST, have the Commandant override the Navy doctor, which he would not do. And I got orders to Quantico, Virginia, where I served as a tactics instructor for a year. That's when it started to become clear to me. Some of the old breed might be just waiting to retire. So, you know, the old breed is typically a very positive connotation. In this case, a lot of people were just waiting out there 20 or 30 years. And I said, this is probably not good for me because I kept speaking up and getting in trouble. So I got out of the Marine Corps after about six years, 1985, and went to grad school, got an MBA and went to work in a damn office. Yeah, not just at any old pittery school. <laughs> yeah. Got that, snuck went to into Harvard. Harvard. Got, just yeah. snuck into Harvard. <laughs> snuck into Harvard, a Marine who could write. Yeah. Without crayons. And if I remember correctly, uh, your mother had a little bit to do with that <laughs> yeah. decision, yeah? Yeah, well, so the funny thing was I loved California, having grown up in Pennsylvania. My mother was super hard charging. She was a, a Navy officer, as was my father. So they were none too happy when I joined the Marines. So as I'm getting out of the Marine Corps, I got accepted to UCLA. It's going to be in-state tuition for my MBA. I got into Penn and got into Harvard. My mother, when I told her I'm going to UCLA, <laughs> she blew a gasket and literally called every person who had been influential in my life back to like my Pop Warner football coaches. So I got flooded with calls, probably 30 calls around. No one in the family has ever gone to Harvard. You have to go to Harvard. Otherwise, you're letting down your mother. So I think it was probably a pretty good call. I reluctantly said, all right. I'm going to suck it up, had to take on a bunch of debt, but it worked out fine. So, as always, mom was right. Listen to your mother, damn it. Yeah. Duke University, Marine Corps, right. Harvard MBA. Yeah. This question always comes up yeah. a lot. It's like, is it, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting conversation that we really need to have a lot now right. as uh, younger guys are getting out and deciding whether or not to yeah. go to school and... I stand pretty 50 50 on it, whether or not, like, hey, you need to get a degree mm -hmm. or you don't need to get a degree or you really should go get an MBA or, right. or not. Um, you know, me personally, I feel like my, my undergrad um, just happened to translate directly. Sure. Like, it, it opened up exactly yeah. the door that I needed it to, to, to be successful and do exactly what I went to school for and got my degree in. Yeah. Do you feel like that was the case for you to where you, you left with that MBA and you were like, 
man, this is really helping open doors and get me to where I need to be. Massive boot to kick open doors yeah. with, for sure. But flipping around to what's relevant for everybody else, you know, I think most people shouldn't go to college and get something impractical like a degree in writing. Wait. <laughs> No, I think you're a good example of you had a sense of what you wanted to do, but you know, a lot of Duke lacrosse players get history degrees. That may not be all that monetizable. A Duke degree generally probably is, but I think people ought to figure out, well, what do they think they want to do in life? And maybe you're better off being an electrician. I know a lot of electricians, plumbers, HVAC techs who own their own businesses they're doing great. They're happy people. They home at the end of the day. People typically aren't calling them up in the middle of the night. They're not worried about the big deal they have to go sort out. So there's no preordained notion that you have to get a college degree. And same would apply on a master's degree. I got a master's degree and fortunately got into Harvard. Why? I had done well in the Marine Corps, but I had no clue as to what I wanted to do. All I wanted to do in the Marines was be the best Marine officer I could be. And I hated getting out, so I thought, all right, my biggest fear is I'm going to be bored. Yeah. So how do I find the most adventure I can find in the civilian world? Hence, I went to Wall Street and worked there. Actually didn't like it, but it was a great stepping stone for the rest of my career. But most people don't need an MBA to be in business. Why didn't you like Wall Street? I found that I was wearing a suit, working in an office. I felt like a staff guy Yeah. rather than a frontline commander. And for me, the highlight was having a platoon at 1-1, having a company at first recon or third recon. I missed that. So like, okay, punch that Wall Street ticket. I'm moving on. But wait, I'm making a lot more money than I made as a Marine. Who cares? It's about mission and the ability to lead and make a difference. Yeah. And banking really is not about leadership. If you get to be a division president at Bank of America, maybe, But for 10 or 15 years, you're really not going to lead. You're going to be a technician, which is great. And it's a noble career. So nothing against any of the bankers out there listening to us. But it was not for me. And what was that next step for you? Next step was I actually went to a small private equity firm called the Henley Group. And that did not work out. It was a great lifestyle business up in New Hampshire, but I was not excelling there. I got a call from a headhunter, and they said, we need a director of in-house mergers and acquisitions at PepsiCo. I thought, well, that's not very interesting. I want to be a leader. If you do this well, you get to go to Pepsi, Frito, Taco Bell, Pizza, or KFC. There'll be a lot of general management opportunities. Interesting. Put me in, coach. I just got married, so we did that in Purchase, New York. My wife and I lived in Southern Connecticut. Yeah. So that's that's super interesting to me and how important that was for you to like be a leader continually. Why why is that so ingrained with you is to like not roll solo and and really want yeah. to work with a whole bunch of people? Because I realized I was never going to be the smartest guy in the room at a place like Goldman Sachs. I was never going to be a great kind of individual technician or contributor. But I thought I had learned so much in the military, as most of us do. I wanted to put that to work and test if what I learned as a Marine would work in the world of business. I wanted responsibility. I wanted a platoon or a company to lead. I was willing to bet on myself that what I learned in the Marine Corps would translate. Pretty good bet. I think it's worked out all right. It's worked out all right. Yeah, I like to say what I learned in the Marine Corps is much more important than what I learned at Harvard. Harvard was kind of a great finishing school, a tremendous network of people right before I came in here. I had a call with some people at Bank of America where one of the senior executives sat next to me at Harvard Business School. Like, hey, what's up, David? How you doing? So that never hurts, but it's that experience we all got in the military that is the most important. Yeah. Now... <clears throat> that that position ultimately led to going to be the COO of Taco Bell, right? Ultimately, right. But I had to go take a division of Taco Bell. So two years in Purchase, New York, had an opportunity to go work for Pizza Hut or Taco Bell. I like, tacos better than pizzas. And I had said to my wife, I've got it all wired. We're either going to Irvine, California, San Francisco, Atlanta, maybe Chicago, maybe stay in New York. 
So one day I got a call. Hey, you're green lighted to go to Taco Bell, but we need you in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> I'd never, never been to Nashville. I called my wife. I was on a trip. She's back home in Connecticut. Probably had a couple too many pops. She's like, where the hell is Nashville, for Christ's sake? <laughs> so she was not happy. We'd only been married two years. I'm getting ready to pluck her out of the Northeast. She had grown up in New York. Parents were in upstate New York. She had gone to college in upstate New York. It's like we're moving to Tennessee. Where the heck is that? Fortunately, when we arrived there, we found out she had one friend from college, St. Lawrence University. She had one friend who was in Nashville. Boom. Worked out great. She ended up being very happy there. I think Nashville and New York are a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Slightly, slightly. Just a bit. But we met a country doctor who helped Molly get pregnant. We had our first daughter there. So Nashville was a home run for us. Yeah. And you still have, are you uh, what we kind of commonly refer to as uh, the, uh, we weren't, you know, technically termed operators, but the operator curse of uh, having nothing but girls. Oh, totally. Yeah. (laughs) And most of my buddies are that way. Mark out, two daughters. Of course, Gad and a couple daughters. Yeah. Curse of the Frogman, Curse of the Operator. <laughs> yep. yep. Classic. <clears throat> and I remember you saying um, a big part of your success at Taco Bell was uh, directly apl- applying some of the principles of the Marine Corps into the, the foundation of yeah. the organization, which is, you know, hilarious and uh, awesome to me that, right. to think of like such a big growth of Taco Bell franchising, you know, it's got little little nuggets of the Marine Corps in it. Right. And what was... Well, Marine Corps old breed sprinkled, sprinkled into that yeah. Taco Bell system. Yeah. No wonder it tastes so good. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the kind of situation with Taco yeah. Bell at the time? I, I got to imagine they're not, they weren't nearly as big as, as what they are now. No, but they had probably 4,000, maybe 4,500 stores. It was big. Taco yeah. Bell was successful. They were in a bit of a tear. Back in the day, at that point in the 90s, they had a three-tier menu. The value menu was the buzzword, 59, 79, 99 cent three-tier menu. And if you think about most businesses and you ask typical business people, what's the most important thing in business? It's to make a lot of money. So Taco Bell was very driven by incredibly smart, ambitious, well-presenting, well-spoken type people. And everybody's just trying to drive the bottom line restaurant contribution or profitability number. The problem was, while the brand was great, competition was coming in on the value menu. So Burger King lowered prices, offered a 99 cent Whopper, which kind of blew us away on value. Sales started tanking. Everybody started trying to make more money by cutting training, by cutting leadership development, cutting supervision. Again, it was not unlike what I saw when I got to third recon. Things were kind of screwed up. But no one wanted to tell the boss, hey, this playbook is not working. So I got in there and the corporate playbook was however many restaurants you had and how many above store leaders, they were called market managers at the time, you had to cut down the number of market managers you had. So I had roughly 300 restaurants, 300 Taco Bells. They were all company owned at that point. And I had roughly 25 above store leaders or market managers. And the goal was to cut that number by about half. Wow. And so I was like, well, okay, boss. My boss was a former Army lieutenant. Hey, boss, and we'll leave his name out of this, boss. How's that going to work? So right now, if somebody's got 10 to 12 restaurants as it is, and they need to get there every week, It's awfully hard to do that. You only spend a half day at each restaurant, a five day, even six day work week, got travel time. If you're trying to run restaurants around the city of Nashville, they are spread out. So essentially the playbook was save money by cutting your above store leadership, your NCOs, if you will. Mm. So everybody else in the system, the other five regional vice presidents did that. In the meantime, I wasn't willing to cut back on my above store supervision. So I kind of held the line, started doing some training. I actually brought in a fantastic speaker and leader, a guy named Dr. Jim Lair, who's got a PhD in education. 
He uh, has built something called the Human Performance Institute, which he sold to J&J. So Jim came in, he had just written a book called Stress for Success, and he coined something called the Corporate Athlete. So we we're teaching our above store leaders, those market managers, how to be more effective, how to be kind of in that high performance zone, the zone every day as much as they could. They were training their store managers. And we started to get prescriptive around what would be effectively a five paragraph order for store visits. And it worked. I was getting better results, but I got my ass chewed for not cutting down on the above store leadership. Mm. I would have to imagine your lifespan at Taco Bell didn't go much longer after that. You would think, but turned out I had better results and they started to improve year after year. I had that job three years. By then, Taco Bell was really not doing well as a company. And long story short, I was asked to come to California to work for the same uh, army officer. Pretty funny story. The people who had my job, which was called Vice President of Operations Services, three people over about 18 months either quit or gotten fired from that job. So my boss, again, corporate politics, said, come on out, I'll take care of you. This will be a great stepping stone for you. It's like, really? The last three people are gone? <laughs> Company's not doing well. I'm going to uproot my family from Nashville, Tennessee with my new daughter and wife and come out there. I got gotcha, you. No problem. So we move out to California. My first day on the job, this individual said, hey, meet me at Sports Club Irvine, big health club next to Taco Bell Tower in Irvine. I sit down and Keep in mind, he's been recruiting me for this job for about eight, maybe 10 weeks. So now I'm in town. He says, hey, got some news for you, Tom. I'm leaving Taco Bell. I've always wanted to be a CEO. I'm going to a CEO job. (laughs) Okay, my first day. Where's my daddy after this? Uh, How do I do this thing? So he left. A guy named John Martin, who was CEO at the time, got fired. So I'm sitting there thinking, wow, the whole chain of command's blown up. Individual named John Antiaco came in. He ended up leaving. So fortunately, when the dust settled, I had a plan of attack. I talked to David Novak, who was the new leader of what was going to become Yum, an independent company. I said, sir, here is my plan to take what I did with Marine Corps leadership techniques, common sense, day-to-day execution, you know, checklists, making no assumptions around how things happen. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Here's a plan to turn around the whole Taco Bell system. I got the job of COO. It was 1997. (laughs) All due to Marine Corps leadership principles, because to your point about maybe it wouldn't work out well, I knew I was either going to work and be successful or get fired. And I would say a key lesson in business is if you believe you're right, it's not that you should pound your chest and say, I'm right. If you don't like it, fire me. I knew what I was doing worked because I had my team behind me. I had alignment in the restaurants. The results were following. It was not a big risk. So I didn't follow orders and cut costs and cut my overhead above store. But I invested in leadership and talent, and I made more money. So I got there the long way. Try and get there the short way. Easiest way to make more money at a restaurant is cut your overhead, cut your staff. What does that do for customer service? You don't need to be a genius with a Harvard Business School degree to know service goes downhill, sales are going down at some point. Right. Might look good for a week. But that was the plan. The plan was invest in leadership development, invest in execution. That got me the COO job. Yeah, I have to imagine you ran into a fair amount of resistance, like this former Marine officer, yeah. like, hey, we're going to do the, what the Marine Corps did for Taco Bell. Right. I can imagine a lot of people like, ah, I don't know yeah, about that. Yeah, so I disguised it. I left the Marine Corps out of it. Beautiful. Yeah, and to repackage it because no one wants to hear, hey, when I was deployed to Okinawa or Afghanistan or Iraq, here's the way we did things. That's going to be a big turnoff factor. So a key lesson, I think, is you've got to repackage and make it relevant for people. They want to know, WIFM, what's in it for me? Yep. And... You know, we've, not very recently, but that's right. that's where Black Rifles also shifted to here is like we're, you know, in the process of trying to refine 
our day-to-day operations and how we're going about business is like, well, let's just use the five paragraph order. Yeah. And how about that? Guess what? Right. It works really good. It, it does. works extremely well. It gets everybody on the same page in a very cohesive, concise way. Sure. And then it's intuitive once people see the framework. It is situation. Hey, what's going on? You don't need to worry about enemy dispositions much when you're writing right, a right. business situation five paragraph order. Yeah. It almost becomes this this other language yeah. that, that you can speak with right. with the people that you work with and really facilitate ease in, in trying to accomplish the mission. Right. That reminds me of a story. When I was at Quantico, my first class to teach as a tactics instructor was the five-paragraph order. So as a new guy, they give you the worst, most boring class. Of course. You have to murder board it. Have you ever murder boarded anything? Yeah. So for anybody who's not heard that term, it's you have to teach the class or demonstrate the techniques to other people who already mastered the class or the techniques and at least at that point in Quantico, any one of those people would give you thumbs down, come back next week. You're not ready. It could even be, we don't like your gig line or your uniform or your shoes are not shiny enough. I took a little bit of a critique, but nobody dinged me. I'd spit shine my shoes rather than wear core fams. They're like, get the damn core fams. Your spit shine's not good enough. Thank you, Major McQuarrie. So I get my five paragraph order class, which was really just a rote memorization of this outline. But the way I innovated around that was the fronts of these classrooms were all covered with wall-to-wall carpeting. So I looked at these big empty walls and said, hey, wait, I can take the paragraphs and the subparagraphs of this five-paragraph op order and turn them into placards with a hook from Velcro on the back. So as the lieutenants would file into the class, I would randomly hand out, you know, if you count up, Every paragraph and subparagraph, there's probably 15 of these things. So I'd pass them out and not really say anything as I kick off the class and say, all right, lieutenants, when I announce your paragraph heading or subparagraph heading, I want you to move by the most direct military man in the front of the room and put the sign up on the wall. <laughs> Am I clear? Yes, sir, Captain Davin. So, you know, situation. Lieutenant would politely stand up and I'd yell, you better move it. You better take the most direct route. <laughs> So by the time you got to command and signal paragraph five, lieutenants would jump up, flip a desk over, step on people's heads, charge up to the front of the room. It took a lot of crap for yeah, that. But people talking. remembered every element of that five paragraph yeah. order. And today I still run into people out there, wait, are you Captain Davin from the basic school? You taught that five paragraph order class? Yes, I am. So you can take any subject and pump it up and make it relevant. Yeah. And how important is that as a as an overall lesson is like if you can take the most boring thing right that everybody has to learn and then figure out a way to make it not only stick but if you are enjoying it and you see the purpose and what you're learning as you're going through it it's totally much more likely right. to be sticky and stick with you as you go through yeah not to mention if you're the leader or the instructor man it's going to be a lot more fun for you yeah. Where you feel like you're, you're making a difference, and, yeah. and you know, <clears throat> let your personality show through. You've got to be you. I always tell people in the military or business: take the best of the people you admire and grab a piece of that, but don't try and be like somebody else. Take elements, but you have to be you. You have to be authentic, authentic about your own personality. You yeah. got to be true to yourself. Yeah. If you're not sure who you are, well, go spend some time and figure it out. Yeah. This is like, you know, I can't, I can't remember how many classes I would be in. And it's like, you know, the term, you know, bobbing for Cox, which you got yeah, the class right. sitting back there nodding off. And oh, yeah. you look at the instructor and it's like, is it the material or mm-hmm. is it you? And then you guys, you got those guys at the front of the room who right. are like, okay, stand up, shake right. your legs. Like, really, that's all you're yeah. going to do. Is that, gonna, sure. is that going to make a big difference? Or even worse, when you roll into a session, somebody says, I'll apologize in advance. It's a really dry topic. It's like, oh, <laughs> come on, man. Don't lower my expectations yeah, so much. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We've only got 70 PowerPoint slides right. to get through today. And, you know, about five minutes each, you know, we're going to be here for a little while. Right. And it's like, ah. Death by PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Tom, that is not even getting remotely close to you know, the amount of stuff you've done post-military. Um, but there was, there's one other thing we had kind of talked to in the conversations leading up to this. And um, you brought up the fact that you, you, you once had an opportunity to like potentially take the development of retail stores for Apple. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, well, I think a lesson here is a lot of people will say, Tom, you've made all the right moves. And it's like, that is absolutely not true. So early days, slightly different story. I'll get to that one in a second. Early days, I got to know Howard Schultz, or a friend of mine from Duke, a guy named Dan Levitan. Dan is Mavron's leader. Mavron is Howard Schultz and Dan's private investment vehicle. Phenomenal world-class venture capital firm. And Howard, a couple times, had offered me to come work at Starbucks early, early days. But I was at Taco Bell, and I was happy, so I passed on that opportunity. So when I became chief operating officer in 1997 at Taco Bell, they did a New York Times piece on me. And it turns out a guy named Steve Jobs had read that. Steve Jobs had just gone back to Apple. Apple's market cap at the time, which is hard to believe they're a trillion-dollar company now, market cap. Yeah, because they took, after they let him go, they took a huge dive, right? Right. They brought in a guy, Scully, from PepsiCo, who did not do well. And at that point in the mid to late 90s, Gateway Computer was struggling. Dell, which had the model, it was more phone-in with a little bit of internet sales, but mostly people calling up to configure computers. That was the model. So I got a call from a headhunter. I ultimately talked to Steve Jobs on the phone. He said, you're my guy. I've done my homework. I want you to be my partner in building out what's going to be a new concept called the Apple Store. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm literally the guy who told Steve Jobs, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> Nobody's going to retail to buy computers anymore. Steve, it's 1997. Don't you see what's going on with Dell? You call them up, they configure the computer, and they ship it to you. It's like, no, 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 we're going to do something really special. Hey, have you seen Gateway Computer? They're getting their asses kicked. They're probably about to go bankrupt. At that point, William Wang, who's become a friend, had started a company that was making TV monitors for Gateway Computer. That was their attempt to stay alive. It did not work. William Wang went on to start Vizio after that, but Gateway was imploding. So I literally more than once told... Steve and his wife, Lorreen, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah, and he's a little bit of a stubborn guy. So yeah. that, that didn't really I think he turned out to be right and I was wrong. So missed a few pitches. Yeah, because the, the iPhone came out like what? Like four years after that? You know, I'd have to take a look. I want to say it was like first. I had my Motorola flip phone at the time. I was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I remember having those... Uh, the, the car bag phones. Yeah. You remember those? Oh, yeah. You sure. Turned down on the floorboards. On they were car. luggable, not portable. <laughs> yeah. You'd have your messenger bag, and then on top of that, you just, you got this other like, briefcase size bag that you can lug around a phone with. Yeah. Yeah. I've got other excuses about not taking that job. Like my wife, Molly, didn't want to move up to NorCal, but no, it was just a bad business call on my part. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're not really filled with a ton of regret at that decision at this point. No, I mean, you can really never look back. You can look back and learn from things you did well or mistakes you made or chances you didn't take, but wouldn't change a thing in my life. Yeah. And one thing going back through and, you know, after Taco Bell, you went to yeah. Panda and then 511 after that, um, I always find it interesting, like, another thing that it appeared you brought to the table with these other organizations was um, this, like, cohesiveness through fitness and, like, implementing workplace gatherings yeah. to work out and, and right. to stay healthy. Um, I have to believe that was, like, very purposeful on your part to to create a bond between people and and try and attract and draw sure. and maintain a certain type of individual. Trying to do that here at Black Rifle, Logan, if I can just <laughs> get you to work out a little bit. <laughs> Don't worry, Bert Thorne's building our gym next I, week. I know, <laughs> I know, can't wait. Yeah, I, I would say just as a lesson for everybody in business, 
you know, you can get people out of the workplace to do something fitness oriented, which doesn't necessarily mean CrossFit, though dot, 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 we built a CrossFit gym at Panda. We ended up being one of the first sponsors of the CrossFit Games about, this is now 13 years ago. But the leveler at Panda was hiking. If you can walk, you can hike. So we started out, hey, we're just going to go for a two-mile hike. Can everybody come? Hey, if you're in a wheelchair or on crutches, no problem. Maybe you can ride the van. And we'd go from one to two-mile hike to a five-mile hike in the Sierra Madre mountain range outside of L.A. And then it was, let's go climb Mount Baldy. Let's go do other hills that are much more significant. And then it got to, let's do the Grand Canyon. And if you do it sequentially, you know, people have to hop in. But the key is if you want to hike Grand Canyon with a bunch of friends, do training hikes because otherwise you get down there. (laughs) You can't turn around. You got to go up. So we ended up with about 25 people from Panda who hiked the Grand Canyon. And those who opted not to, they still were very... Uh, engage in the whole training process. And I'm sure some of it did it on their own later. And you felt like that really translated in the workplace? Totally. It just gives you a different way to build relationships. And I'd say a lot of my friends from the Panda days remember those hikes more than they remember the work. Yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly what, why you were doing that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then at 511 relevant point, we built a gym there in Irvine, just like we're building one here. And I made the mistake of starting with CrossFit classes taught by yours truly. Well, who wants to, you know, do CrossFit with a boss? A few, a few brown nosers, a few, you know, people who knew they could come in and crush it. But the average person was like, okay, let me give you like three reasons why I'm not doing that. The boss, I hate CrossFit. I don't want to embarrass myself. So I then hired a woman. uh, Her name's uh, Alexa Rains husband's a cop in Newport Beach. She came in and all five foot three of her was our CrossFit leader. It's like, oh, you want to go learn Olympic weightlifting? Yeah, Alex will show you how to do it. So that boosted CrossFit attendance. But then we said, okay, if you don't like CrossFit, what do you like? I like yoga. Great, we're having yoga classes next week. I want to do Matt Pilates. No problem. Meditation. Got it. So I just layered in. So when people would tell me I don't have time or I can't, it's like, what are you willing to do? I want to do meditation. Fantastic. Tom, um, I need mandatory strip club visits at Black Rifle <laughs> Coffee. Can we do that? Uh, we, uh, <laughs> post-COVID, we can do that. Post-pandemic, we put it on the list. You've got unique needs. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Classic. And, uh, you know, I think we're probably going to have to have another one of these sit downs to to delve into a little bit more of your background. But um, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And uh, what what's the vision for Black Rifle? Right, come near future. What do we got in the works? Yeah, what, what's kind of what's your uh, your four dimensional scope? Of four things? dimensional. I don't know if I can add up that much to get <laughs> four, but yeah, I would say, look, Evan's vision when he started Black Rock Coffee Company in 2014 was all built around subscription and the other opportunities to buy product with discounts from those who support our community. So he's done an amazing job of creating that subscription business. If you don't subscribe from Black Rifle today, get on the bus, let's do it. But on that foundation, we're then expanding into new channels. So Coffee shops are coming online. West Bitters Road will open in San Antonio, Texas here in a matter of weeks. May only be drive through at the time, but that's coming. We just now rolled into Bass Pro Shops with fixtures for coffee and merch and 152 Bass Pros and Cabela's. We've got a new ready-to-drink line, which, by the way, I'm getting thirsty here. I'll pop yeah. this bad boy. Up. It's a great sound. Yeah, it's a beautiful love that. Sound. Espresso Mocha, it's a winner. So these are now in about 7,000 convenience stores from 7-Eleven to even some Walmarts out there. So it's really about growing the community, partly with content like this, and giving more people opportunities to enjoy Black Rifle. And it's about purpose. It's about staying on mission. It's not about hitting a number or a particular revenue goal. It's about doing everything right to build a community with great product and great content. Yeah, and... <clears throat> on the the ready to drink coffee stuff, um, you know the 
kind of what we talk about in the behind the walls here is um, you know developing the the sugar free mm-hmm. coffee. It's coming. Which, yeah. You know, for the purists yeah. here, right. like we're we're nitro brew guys. Like that's uh, that's where my head's going, and you know. I'll, I typically do one of the RTDs like pre or post workout, yeah. but I, I don't try and do it, you know, outside of around fitness, really. Um, you're not going to have five a day for no. most people. No, 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 no. If you're doing that out there, God bless. We don't have a problem with that. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm a coffee purist in the mm. sense I want to just, yeah. just have, you know, what it is in its most truest right. sense. And so working on that, that nitro cold brew can. And then, and working on nitro cold brew on tap. Yeah, it's coming. Which is big. Which is like with the the nitro. Mm-hmm. Is it that little foamy when the it's mouth on feels tap? unbelievable? That's like yeah. it's the adult version of having an ice cream cone. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, without the sugar. Yeah, or yeah. you know, like it's like a, a mid afternoon Guinness. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? uh, and the other thing I. I we're working on, which I'm super excited about, is like the, we're doing like a, a coffee sparkling water mm-hmm. with, yeah. with uh, quite a bit less caffeine in it. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, usually in the afternoon, we're all right. sucking down the, the spicy waters. Yeah. And so, you know, just, just those two things alone, is, I'm super excited about those. But when, when do you think? You're telling all the secrets here. Come well, on, Logan. Hey, the people need to yeah. know. People need to Little know. Little teasers, Little plant te- those yeah. seeds. I know what they really want to know is uh, when the ready to drinks will be available, kind of more on a nationwide basis, when they can kind of, you know, right. whatever store, sure. whatever, whatever state they're in. What kind of timeline do you think? The COVID pandemic has slowed down the yeah. rollout, but we should be in most locations where we're going to have distribution by August or September. So it's coming. We will have on the website by the end of August, if not sooner a store locator where you can go and say, here's my zip. Where can I find it? Beautiful. Yeah. Just Meantime right pens. now, it's a little hunt and peck, but check out your local convenience store. If they don't have it, ask for it. Yeah. RTD in a can. Which I don't think a lot of people know. Like if, exactly. you, if you have a favorite product, you can just go to the, yeah. the convenience store manager and be like, hey, will you order this yeah. so I can come in and buy it? And they'll be like, you'll buy it? They'll be like, yeah. That's right. why I'm asking you. Uh, no. You know, it's a very simple purchase order after that. Yeah. Where it's on the shelf, it's selling. All right. Well, I'm going to crack one of these two. You know, Good a little, deal. little celebration here. A little, <laughs> little celebratory cheers to the end of the our first uh, Old Breed podcast. We need champagne. We got RTD in a can. You know, baptized by coffee. Amen. Thanks again, Tom. It was awesome. I can't wait to do it again. Semper Fi, my friend. Semper Fi. <laughs>